Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me, let me first of all thank you for inviting me and also thank you for the really very generous introduction. I mean, you described me as an eminent economist. I should tell the audience that economists nowadays uh, are all at the discount around the world. There's a lot of suspicion about economic expertise and rethinking. And we should all be aware of the fact that we should, we should look carefully at what we say uh, to make sure that we are reflecting the real grow, growing and changing consensus. And thank you also for saying nice things about my book. You know, I can't resist the temptation of showing a copy of that book. Since you've encouraged everybody uh, to buy it, I will obviously <laughs> join in that encouragement. And this will <laughs> enable me to say less about the past because I think most of my views are expressed at great length in the book. You know, I, I'm going to use this uh, interaction not so much to provide you with answers. I mean, it's nice to know what's the prospect for the future, et cetera. I wanna first uh, sensitize you to why uh, a fair assessment of this very important issue has become very complex in the current world. So if your objective is a search for truth, then you should be aware of these factors which make it complex. I mean, the first, of course, all over the world, and many of these, by the way, are global phenomena. All over the world, politics has become much more contested and adversarial. And that invariably means that any judgment about the economy uh, is put forward in a context of political contestation. So uh, those in favor of whatever the government is, would like to sort of argue that everything is wonderful. And because of contestation, not even be willing to accept that some mistakes were made. Equally on the other side, those who are opposed to the government will tend to say that everything is bad and not actually recognize that there may be some underlying positive developments in the economy, which are a reflection of uh, this country and the economy and the people and all the rest of it. So I think it's very important to, to keep in mind that the messages that are being thrown at us uh, at any given time are influenced by politics. There's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, in a, in a democracy, that's the way it should be. But I think we should be aware that we need to look behind uh, the political projections to see what is our own assessment of what's happening. The second reason why things are more complicated today have to do with data or the evidence. Now, you know, one of the problems is that uh, traditionally we have relied on official sources of data. And there was, in the old days, uh, you got a GDP growth data for one year. You didn't have quarterly data. Now you have quarterly data. Quarterly data are frequently revised. So we know that the quarterly data contains some errors. And this means that every quarter, there is a, a reassessment of how the economy is go, uh, doing based on official sources. The link to that uh, is a growth, uh, a phenomenal growth of unofficial sources. Uh, you now have things like the Google Mobility Index. Uh, in addition to GDP, you have uh, estimates of demand for power. You have uh, the industry estimates of what's happening to production. And each of these come out at different times of the day. So each of these numbers can be seen to contradict whatever the official number was that was last discussed. So multiple sources of data create their own problems. And we need to be, we need to be aware that uh, the underlying change is not always reflected by the specific data point that is being picked on right now. A third and a more complex and difficult problem is to separate the long term from the short term. Now, for example, right now, the short term is all dominated by the pandemic and when the economy is going to recover. You know, the pandemic was not the result of a policy uh, problem, it was a global phenomenon. Uh, it hit all countries, many countries were badly affected. 
uh, countries have reacted in different ways. And I think you can be reasonably confident that uh, we certainly got hit very badly. Uh, GDP growth fell by 7.3%. Some people say that this is dominantly based on what happened in the formal sector. Uh, but what happened in the informal sector was worse. And that is not adequately reflected yet in GDP because the data on the informal sector will become available only much later. So some people say it went down more than 7.3%. Then you have this huge debate about whether the economy is recovered. Now, of course, forget about the unofficial. If it went down by 7.3% from 100 base to, let us say, 92.7, and it goes back to 100 from 92.7, that is an increase of actually more than 7.3% because the decline is on a base of 100 and the recovery of the same absolute amount is on a base of 92.7, which is lower. And therefore the growth rate will be higher. So that's, that's uh, getting back to normal means that in the year 21, 22, which is the current year, we will have what looks like a high growth. But that is only going to get us back to where we were. So basically we will have lost two years of growth. Okay, I mean, the pandemic was an external shock. You can have a debate on whether we could have done better and had less of a negative impact, but we would certainly have had a negative impact. And I don't think there's any doubt that we are now getting back uh, to normal. Uh, and probably if the vaccination program uh, proceeds more or less satisfactorily, um, the recovery will get pretty well established by the beginning of the next financial year. I mean, the government at one stage had said that everybody will be back, every adult will be vaccinated by end of December. There are newspaper reports which say that there are shortages of vaccines. We may not be able to achieve that. But you know, even if 80% uh, get vaccinated, uh, in terms of expectation of return to normalcy, uh, that will certainly make uh, a big contribution. So we can assume that this is going to happen. But the real question is, uh, what is the long-term prospect from the Indian economy? Uh, is it we will go back to the pre-pandemic growth rate? Now, if so, what is that underlying pre-pandemic growth rate? You know, if you look at the entire period from, let's say, the year 2003 or so, uh, right up to maybe 2000. 17, uh, the growth rate is actually quite high, 7.6%. Um, most of this was the UPA period. Then there was a slowdown in the last three years of the UPA. That was overcome in the first three years of the current government. You put it all together, it's not bad. It comes to about 7.6%. But then in the last three years before the pandemic, the economy slowed down. It gradually went down from 6 to 5 to 4. So the question that comes up now is that when we get back, let's say beginning of next year, the level of output in the economy looks about the same as it was in 2019-20. Are we then going to go back to a growth rate of the old seven plus percent? Or are we going to go back to the growth rate of the immediate pre-pandemic years? Now, to answer this question, you have to ask yourself, was the slowdown of the three years before the pandemic due to some structural problems or was that just bad luck and it will reverse itself automatically? Uh, I mean, generally what happens is that, you know, when you have a long period of growth, uh, the economy does well under a certain set of policies then it hits a new set of constraints for that, you need new sets of reforms to deal with those constraints. And you can only recover the high growth which you showed earlier if you are able to overcome those. So the question is, what are those? Have we identified them? Are we putting them firmly on the agenda? That's not the only thing. Future growth is also dependent on what future challenges come up. What's it going to look like? Uh, what, what are the new challenges which weren't there earlier? Okay. Now, actually, there are 
very important with new challenges. Again, not just for India, but for the world as a whole, but India has to face that. And those challenges relate, first of all, to climate change. I think it's very clear now that the totality of government actions to promote growth around the world has led to an acceleration of global warming. And if nothing is done about this, uh, there will be very serious negative effects on global climate and India will be one of the worst affected. I mean, for us, more droughts, uncertainty of monsoons, concentration of rainfall in a few areas, which means a lot more flooding and erosion, rise of sea levels. Uh, I think the Bombay, one of the Bombay municipal officials even said that if you don't manage to combat climate change, uh, the mantralia in Bombay may well be experiencing sea level on the first floor. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but there's no doubt that over the next 20 years, uh, there will be this change. Now, should we worry about this change? The answer is definitely we should. I mean, simply because if you want to prevent that change 20 years from now, you have to start taking action now. I mean, it's not good enough to say, we don't have to do anything now, we'll think about it 10 years later because many of the decisions you take today uh, will actually constrain your ability to correct this problem later. So this is a new challenge that we have to face. I think also uh, it's now increasingly felt that pandemics will become more common. Uh, you have new pandemics, uh, they're likely, and given globalization and international travel, they will spread quite rapidly around the world. Uh, and therefore, our health system, uh, including especially our public health system, has to be greatly strengthened to be able to deal with the recurrence of these pandemics. Now, we've seen in the course of the last couple of years uh, what the COVID-19 pandemic did. Now, imagine another four or five years later, if some other pandemic of this kind emerges, are we going to be doing exactly the same thing? Uh, I hope not. But then that's something that has to be built into uh, our policies. Now, finally, we have to also recognize that future growth will have to take place in the context of a world that has changed. And this world change is something that affects our own policies. I mean, for example, globally, uh, the United States has lost its preeminent economic position. It's still the largest and the most important country but its share of global GDP has been steadily falling. Now, you know, it was expected that uh, the developed countries would grow faster because they start at a lower level and that their share will rise. Had the US share fallen and the rise in the share of the developing countries be spread more widely across developing countries, you would not have what you actually have, which is the rise of China dominating everybody else. I mean, in effect, what has happened is that China has managed to grab uh, the biggest share of the increase in GDP. Now, this is to the credit of the Chinese government that they took advantage of the opportunities, managed to grow rapidly. We should view it as a criticism of ourselves that we did not put in place the kind of policies that would have made us, made us capable of competing. I mean, we did do a lot of that in the last 10, 15 years. And during that period of the 2000s, India began to grow rapidly and even grew at more than 8%. And people began to think, aha, this is now the takeoff of India. But I mean, since then, it, it has slowed down. And quite apart from the pandemic, uh, the growth rate has slowed down. So the question is, in the future, uh, the global economy is dominated by a growing fear of China. This is partly due to geopolitical reasons and partly due to economic reasons. But what it has done is it has led to a pushback on globalization. And it is very often argued that the option that China has to export to Western markets is no longer available to us. I think that's actually wrong. Because, you know, the, uh, the tension between the West and China is at the high tech end. I mean, the West feels threatened by China because of its dominance in high-tech areas, 
telecommunications, artificial intelligence, etc., cybersecurity, and so on. I don't think that they feel threatened uh, by buying Chinese uh, T-shirts and Chinese simple manufactured goods. It could be that some of the somewhat anti-China sentiment is making them move away from too much dependence on, uh, on China, but that's to our advantage. And therefore, I feel that those who say that the recommendation that India should make a strong pitch for exports uh, is outdated because the world has changed because of the changed attitudes towards globalization, this is not actually valid. Uh, there's a big role, there's a big scope for expanded exports from India. And it all depends on whether we are able to implement the kind of policies and to strengthen the competitiveness of our industry in these many areas uh, in order to benefit from it. So that's an important issue. What is, what is going to be our policy towards openness and trade and foreign direct investment? So this is just to tell you what a complex situation it is. I don't want to, as I said, I'm not giving you a soothsayer's uh, guide to what the future is going to look like. But towards the end, I do want to say something uh, which gives you a sense of how I see things. Okay? Now, I see things that with a moderately successful vaccination drive, and let's hope it's even more than moderately successful, India is well positioned from the next year onwards, 22, 23. The economy will be ready to perform Certainly, the formal sector uh, will have got back to square one. The informal sector is still hurt uh, and will be struggling, but it will also, as the formal sector grows, it will also begin to expand. What is the growth rate going to be? Now, my view is, if we go back to the pre-pandemic growth, 5% or so, uh, that will be tough because all our past experience shows that, you know, at 5% growth, you don't generate enough employment and you certainly don't generate enough of a push to re reduce poverty in the country. It is when our growth rate exceeded 8% after 2004 for several years that we were able to see a significant drop in poverty. Even in those years, by the way, employment increased but it was not high quality employment. You know, during the period of the UPA, there was a lot of criticism that this is jobless growth. I don't think that was correct. Uh, the data show that employment expanded. It has since decided, it has since slowed down. Employment expanded, but the employment was in non-contractual, uh, non-regular employment, even in the organized sector. I mean, even the organized sector when they took on labor, took on contract labor, but not permanent labor. And this raises an issue that, you know, are the labor laws that we have discouraging employers from hiring people permanently? Now, this is a highly controversial issue. And I mean, those of you who are more inclined to take, let's say, a left view on things, could legitimately point to many studies that say that, look, labor laws are not uh, a constraint. I personally think that they actually are. Uh, I'm not, by the way, for one second saying that we shouldn't have labor laws. I'm not for one second saying that the state shouldn't be there protecting the interests of labor. I mean, I think, for example, labor regulation regarding safety and element of social security an aspect of unemployment insurance, these are very important. But a set of regulations that say that you can't get rid of labor without the permission of the government of India or the government of the state, I think this is really too rigid. This is not what exists elsewhere. And certainly not what exists in the countries we are competing with, like Bangladesh and Vietnam. So while we have changed the labor laws to some extent, uh, I, I think part of the problem is the approach we have adopted is that we have said that, look, earlier, the Industrial uh, Development Act, Development Regulation Act, uh, applied to any enterprise which hired 100 people. So we raised that 
for 300 people. This means that all these laws don't apply if you're only hiring up to 300 people. So I have two problems with that. First, you know, I think there's no reason to remove labor-related uh, regulation, labor, labor safety and uh, on-work safety-related regulations uh, to higher levels. What is needed is a better approach to labor flexibility. I think we have introduced, and it's a good thing, that you can now have contract employment for a one-year period. So a person gets a job only for one year, and, and it will have to be renewed at the end of the at the end of that year. You know, I would say that uh, you need flexibility uh, in a much bigger range of industry, not just people who hire 300. You need flexibility even amongst people who may be hiring 1,000 or 1,500 people. So how to be able to get rid of labor or take labor off when the, there is a downturn in the economy, this requires some careful thought. Uh, and my suspicion is that a mere contractual arrangement doesn't solve the problem. Because if you're contractually committed to someone for a year and you have a downturn at the start of that period, that still imposes quite a high cost. So that's one issue. I want to emphasize uh, that it requires a whole day seminar uh, to come to a conclusion. Uh, but I think that's an issue that we have to consider. I would also say that you know we need we need to recognize that we are not giving our people the skills that they need in order to compete in the world that is changing so rapidly. I mean, uh, technologies in the next ten years are going to change much more than they have changed in the previous ten years, uh, and certainly much more than in the previous twenty years. I think one of the con I mean. One of the problems we have is that we have an excellent uh, set of uh, better in, uh, educational institutions. They produce pretty good people. Uh, but, and that's evident from the fact that many of the people who graduate from these institutions, I don't just mean the IITs, I mean, let's say the top, maybe the top 100 Indian universities also produce pretty good people. But we have a proliferation of universities both public and private, where the quality of output is not at all assured. People are getting degrees who employers feel are unemployable. And the other thing, quite honestly, is that the degrees are very often uh, involved with training in technologies that are now got dated. I think we have to move to a situation where people will stop thinking of education and training as something which they get up to the age of 22 or something, after which they join the labor force and they're employed for that. The fact is, if technologies are going to train, people who've joined the labor force may need to come back uh, into a skill development uh, program of some kind to pick up some special skills. Now, at the moment, uh, many universities have uh, business uh, management courses for managers to come in. But there aren't many cases where uh, a person with uh, technical skills can go back for a six month course in some of these new technologies. And we need to introduce that in a much more imaginative way. If we want to create a skill force capable of the economy to grow at 7% or so. We also need to have a much, much better uh, credit system, which makes credit available uh, to small and medium businesses. Now, having said that, let me, let me step back a little and also say that our approach to small and medium business also has to change. You know, I don't think people realize that when we call, when we look at small and medium business, a very, very large proportion of the businesses that we have Actually, almost 94% of the businesses we have actually hire less than 10 people. And 84% are actually what are called own account enterprises that don't hire anybody other than the owner and maybe a family member. So, you know, this, this is a degree of informality which is not consistent with moving ahead in a rapidly 
modernizing world. We need many, many more enterprises in the middle range, enterprises that hire between 100 to 1,500 people. And a lot of the small scale sector uh, will inevitably undergo a restructuring internally in the sense that those that are more able to take on modern technology will expand and will flourish. And those that are not will actually get pushed out. Now, the labor employed in these smaller enterprises will presumably get employed in the inter enterprises that are expanding, but they won't be owning their own small little enterprises anymore. And this is a huge problem, which somehow, I mean, you see aspects of that when you look at the uh, competition between, let's say, uh, the organized sector, online distribution segment, uh, and the Kirana store. Uh, I mean, Kirana stores will remain, but, you know, they will be under pressure and it's the more efficient amongst them, the ones that are more likely to modernize that will still attract footfalls. So we are in for a structural change here. Now, these structural changes will lead to some people losing their source of employment. This, this becomes relatively easy to manage if the economy goes rapidly, sort of 8% plus. It's almost impossible to manage if the economy slows down to four and a half percent. So the second factor, the slowing down, it gets reflected not so much in open unemployment, but massive underemployment. People still carry on uh, in their own own account worker enterprises. Uh, small shops still continue because they're not able to get higher paid jobs in the more modern sector. But their incomes uh, collapse. I mean, if you're running a stock, a shop or a, a samosa stall or whatever it is, you know, you could be earning 10,000 rupees a year, a month, or if it's a very successful store, a shop, or you could be earning 3,000 a year. And between that period, you'll all be described as employed. Although the person who's earning just 3,000 a year from running a small shop is obviously aware that, you know, it doesn't even equivalent to what you would call uh, an unskilled wage. They still prefer to hang on because they're hoping that they'll be able to do better. So in some sense, uh, the willingness of small and economically unviable enterprises to exit is a function of the rate at which the economy grows. You know, if you go to our farmers, I mean, statistics show that 40% of farmers don't want to be in farming. They would prefer to move and go to some uh, other activity which gains, gives them a higher wage. They're stuck in farming because they don't have any alternative. So I think looking forward, uh, whichever way you look at it, I don't think a four or five percent growth rate is going to be sustainable. And the main reason for that is that it may look to you that a four and five percent growth rate means that everybody's income will go at four percent. And what's wrong with that? Maybe it should be better at eight percent, but at four percent, you're still benefiting. I don't think that's the case. What will happen is at four percent, much greater economic distress in the formal se informal sector. The informal, large numbers of enterprises in the informal sector may still survive, but they'll not be earning a decent living wage. And that would create a lot of unhappiness. Typically, you see this unhappiness in the unemployment rate amongst the young, and especially amongst the educated young. Now, these unemployment rates are very high at the moment. And I think what's happening is because there has been some economic development and families at all levels, all levels uh, have more economic uh, strength than they did, let's say 20 years ago. Uh, children from these families, I mean, that I'm excluding the very, very poor, but I'm obviously the very, very poor before the pandemic was about 20% of the population. And the entire middle from the 30th to the 50th percentile, uh, a child who, who's just entering the labor force 
has certain expectations of the kind of job he deserves. And if he doesn't get that, he doesn't take whatever job comes. He waits for a while. He remains unemployed. And that can have very damaging effects, both on the individual and on society. Uh, and we need to be we need to be aware. The solution to that is to get back to high economic growth, so that there are many job opportunities. Remember, many people will not get the jobs they want, but if the job they get is not too bad, they're still satisfied. But when the jobs they get are really below the, their expectation, I mean, then you are sowing the seeds of discord. And that's why our, our entire growth strategy post-22-23 uh, should be how to get back on a higher growth. Now, that involves many things. I mean, one of the most important things is that we need a much better infrastructure. India's infrastructure has improved over the last 10 to 15 years. But it's nowhere where it needs to be if you want broad-based growth in the economy. I mean, you know, no matter which part of the country you're in, if you're running a business, you should have good access to other parts of the country through a better road and rail transport system. And this requires money. Uh, and this money can only come from the government and through some forms of public-private partnership. Now, government is trying to do that through this monetization of asset support, which is a form of uh, public-private partnership, if you like. This was a, a line that we had also pushed way back in the UPA days that uh, the government by itself cannot develop all the infrastructure you need. So you have to do it through public-private partnership. Now, there were lots of problems. Uh, and you know, we tried to handle some of them. One of the difficulties with public-private partnership is that the public at large is much more intolerant about a problem that it comes up when the, there's a private sector person managing it than they are when the same problem comes up when the public sector is managing. So yeah. expectation from the private sector is that, look, you're making a lot of money, so you should be providing a better service, which is good. But you know, you need a better regulatory system. You need a system where the nature of the concession contract is such that is reasonable to both sides. And we found that all these things have problems. So that's not a surprise that's happened all over the world. You have to learn from it. But the key thing is you have to recognize that if you want a lot more infrastructure, it simply isn't going to come only from the public sector. So you have to work to make the public-private enterprise effort uh, more successful. And finally, uh, is the issue of openness of the economy. You know, I think there are some areas on which we now have a consensus on policy. I venture to suggest that there is now a consensus that high growth is going to come dominantly from the private sector. Uh, it's not going to come because we're going to have an expanded public sector, a bunch of employers. There may be differences of view on that, and some people may say, that we are putting too much weight on the private sector. But I think that's what's happening around the world. If it's going to come from the private sector, then you have to be careful that the private sector is appropriately regulated. Now, what does regulation mean? Some of it involves government regulations. Some of it involves competition. I mean, the best way to regulate the private sector is to subject it to competition. That means that nobody should be allowed to expand into a monopoly situation. How do you prevent that? Not by doing what we did in the 70s, which is to prevent them from expansion. I think you do that by allowing more competition, including a form of war. Now, at the moment, the policy that we are following, there seems to be a consensus that uh, the dominant source of growth will be the private sector. There seems to be a consensus that we should work towards improving the ease of doing business. The central government has to do a lot of that. State governments also have to do a lot of that. There's a consensus that we need better infrastructure. Not enough consensus on how to do it through public-private partnership. Uh, there's, there was a consensus that we should keep the economy open and allow competition from imports, which is the best way of uh, uh, disciplining the domestic uh, producer because the consumer has a choice. That seems to have weakened something. 
because in the last four years, we have raised custom duties on a number of products. Now, I, I would say that at the moment, uh, I wouldn't call that uh, an alarming uh, development, but we need clarity from the government. Are we retreating into the protectionism of the past? Now, to the credit of the government, many representatives of the government have said no, that what we are really trying to do is to give a boost to certain kinds of domestic areas, which would help them be competitive, but they should be competitive, they should make in India for export. You know, the moment you say make in India for export, you are assuring that they will have high quality and they'll be price competitive. So that's a good strategy if we stick to it. But the other side of that coin is that you cannot keep raising import duties because you cannot produce everything domestically. Many things have to be imported. And if you raise import duties, you simply raise the, the cost of production of domestic products, which makes them uncompetitive internationally. I think this is an area where uh, I sense that the issue is open. Many people you will hear say that the world has turned back from globalization, so why should we remain open? I think that's not a correct reading of the situation. It is true that in the United States, there's a lot of anti-China feeling, but I don't think that they're shutting down. The world is not shutting down its economy or shutting out imports. So I think that's a, that's a misreading of the situation and we should not fall into that. Now, having said all that, uh, the bottom line is we need to act on multiple fronts. We need to ensure a revival of private investment. We need to get much better education and health to the public, which is a government job. And that's the job that the government should be concentrating on most of all. And if we get all this right, and the world does not break up into fragments, which I don't think it will, there's in my view a good reason to believe that India could grow at seven plus percent. That should be our target. And I think we should have a very, uh, very clear approach to policy where the, the targets that are expected to be achieved by each policy are clearly spelled out. And then the policy and its implementation is judged by whether those targets are achieved. And we will make mistakes because nobody knows what to do exactly. But as long as we're clear that these are the targets, this is the policy, let's judge if it's working. If it's not working, let's rethink. We should not be hung up. Uh, on a particular articulation of policy as being the correct one. We should always be open, and that's really the role of debate uh, in the society. Well, I could go on and on, but I've already exceeded my time, so I'm going to stop at this point and take questions. Thank you so much, sir. Um, for this really uh, wonderful journey across so many different areas and so many different issues, and for addressing just about everything that I personally uh, was, uh, was thinking of. And I'm sure that a large number of us here uh, are now uh, benefited by your views on so many different issues. Uh, I would like to throw this open for questions now. Uh, there are already some questions that are here. Uh, I will first welcome Professor Hasina Hashia. Uh, Professor Hashia, are you... If you're there, I'd like you to ask the question. Otherwise, I can ask that on your behalf. Is Professor Hasina Hashia unmuted? So, uh, Professor Hasina Hashia, one of our very senior uh, colleagues at the IOS, and uh, she's asking this very, uh, very, very interesting and a very contemporary question that when there is a revenue shortfall, then how wise is, is it to mortgage state property or, or, you know, to sell? Now it is called monetization. So your comments on what is happening with sale of government assets under the PPP or whatever mode uh, across the board, railways and PSUs and whatever. Your, your view on that. Well, uh, yeah, let me, you know, the, I think you're talking about the asset monetization program where they listed a whole That's lot right. of existing assets that have been created and they want to hand it over to the private sector uh, for a 30 year contract or something like that, at the end of which it reverts to the government. Now, this is not outright privatization because the asset reverts to the government. And I think that where 
assets involve critical land assets, it is very sensible to let it revert to the government rather than sell it outright. No, the question about uh, revenue shortfall, you know, it's true that if you give it out, the revenue of getting from this asset, you won't get. But the only logic of giving it out is that you'll get more revenue from the private sector fellow than you are getting in net terms from your own operation. I mean, that's where, for example, uh, it's for the government to calculate what is a minimum acceptable bid. And that minimum acceptable bid should be clearly uh, better than hanging on to the asset itself. Now, there are two, two aspects to this. One is that instead of getting a stream of revenue over time, okay, you're getting it all, you're getting a lot of it as a lump sum in the beginning. I can see the point that if you're, if, if those two are actually equivalent, then really it's not very different from simply borrowing to create more assets uh, and retaining the existing revenue stream, as opposed to giving up the revenue stream and getting that lump of money to create more assets. But, you know, I think, for example, uh, the assumption behind this approach is that the person to whom you hand it over is going to make better use of it than you will and will generate much more revenue. Let me, I mean, roads are one example, but let me give you uh, the example, let's say, of the Jawaharlal Nehru uh, Stadium. Frankly, when I was in government uh, during the UPA times, uh, I had actually suggested that we should do a public-private partnership with the Jawaharlal Nehru Stadium, because I felt what was happening with that stadium was that once in five or 10 years, when we had an international competition, we would spruce it up. But in the course of the year, it was not adequately used. Nobody cared very much about it. And we didn't have a management that was very keen to then go for a revenue share. Because, you know, a really successful operator may, may not be able, may not be very sure of what revenues he's likely to get. But once he's got the uh, concession, he will try very hard to get the maximum revenue. So you can share in the prosperity of the concession even in future. So I am not against, uh, I'm not against the use of existing public assets, providing, and this is the critical point, providing, what you get for them is leading to an expansion of other public sector infrastructure or public infrastructure. And other people say, for example, this is like selling the family silver. Now, you know, if you're selling the family silver in order to engage in unproductive consumption, that's a bad thing. But if you're selling the family silver in order to buy some more family silver, new family silver, that's not such a bad thing. So I... I now, having said that, the test of whether this succeeds is going to be the terms on which the uh, asset monetization takes place. You know, the Nidhi Ayog has produced a very impressive list of projects and be it sold over six years or so. I think it's much better if the government were to identify upfront that here are the five or six projects that we want to make it plain what is the draft uh, concession agreement the terms on which this is going to be done, call the relevant uh, bidders who are likely to bid, ask them their views. They will suggest many changes. Be willing to consider those changes and then come up with a draft where you are able to say that, look, this was our original intention. We have called all the possible competitors. And when you call competitors, you should call international competitors also, not just limited to the domestic ones. And this is what they have suggested. We think the following changes are reasonable. We are now going to invite bids on this. And even have a discussion, public discussion. Is there something wrong with that particular proposal? So I think if you do that, there'll be a lot of transparency and people will be more reassured that this is not just handing over an asset to a crony or something like that. I mean, there have been these allegations made and they are serious allegations, things to worry about. But I think they can be handled. And they can be handled by making the terms on which this is done uh, transparent and ensure bidding. 
I mean, look, if somebody thinks that this is not this is not a good enough term, somebody else should be bidding better. And that's the real test. Probably we will learn we make a mistake. So, I mean, let's do five and let's do another five and then do another five. I think that's not a bad way of proceeding. Thank you so much, sir. I have uh, a few questions, but I'd first go to Professor Furkan Khamar. Uh, Professor Furkan Khamar, uh, may you, uh, yeah, please unmute. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, to the organizer and thank you very much to Dr. Monte Calvalia, sir. It's always such a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, and I think in the past uh, couple of months, there have been many such opportunities. First, Raji Pawar, and then now the Institute of Objective Studies have taken this initiative. So there are uh, uh, two or three points on which I would like you to clarify. Uh, number one, uh, that in a situation where 80 crore, 60 to 65 percent of the population is to be provided five kg of wheat or food grains to sustain during the period of pandemic. It is obvious that mere growth enough may not be able to help. We need to do something more. So what needs to be done? Second thing is on the reform front, I think there is hardly any difference between the previous government and the this government, actually it's most of the previous government's agenda that the present government is pursuing. Of course, there are implementation related uh, issues. We for a long time thought that the financial sector in India is more stable, least risky, but now we are seeing that no, it is quite, quite unstable. Uh, making people jittery about uh, the future of the financial sector. And now these ideas of assets reconstruction companies and bad loans, etc. What are the word of caution? This is not something new. Uh, it has already been implemented elsewhere. So what are some of the caution that you would want to put in that, that must be avoided in order to safeguard and protect the financial sector in the company? Because once we lose the trust in the financial system, I think it will take a very, very long time to recover, or perhaps we might never recover. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Furkan. Nice to see you uh, electronically. I mean, we worked together in the Planning Commission many, many years ago. So it's good to catch up again. Um, well, your two questions, you know, on the food grains and the fact that 60 to 65% are getting food grains free, I don't think you should conclude from that that GDP growth is not enough. The reason they're getting this free is because we have gone through a GDP growth crisis. I mean, you would be right if GDP was growing at the same rate as it was growing when you were in government and this had to happen. The fact is that between 2004 and 2011, uh, the number of people below the poverty line decline. The government did not, I mean, my view was that we, in the Food Security Act, we were providing concessional food for too large a percentage of the population even then. And I raised this issue in backstage. I mean, you know, in a way, we could have, we could have provided more grains to fewer people because what we were providing is really half of what a family needs but somehow there was an insistence that we should provide it to two thirds of the population, which I don't think was necessary. What has happened now, of course, is that, you know, there's no GDP growth, there's negative. So I don't think that the current depend, I, I think the fact that we are giving these food grains free is correct. I mean, this group have been very badly hit uh, by the decline in GDP. The decline in GDP has especially hit the informal sector migrant labor, et cetera. They've all, most of them have gone back to rural areas. And I mean, it was right for the government to provide them with some support. The food grain system existed, so it was very, relatively easy to scale it up. But I don't think that the fact that this is happening is proof that GDP growth doesn't matter, uh, is not enough. The reason it's happening is that GDP growth collapsed. I mean, GDP growth slowed down very substantially after 2017, and then it collapsed to negative, and that's why we've got this problem. 
you know, let's be clear. I view these as temporary things. Our most important objective should be to get GDP growth back to where it was. Now, believe me, if we do that, we will create a lot of employment. The GDP won't get produced if people are not employed. And if people are employed, they'll be getting income. And if they're getting income, they don't need to get support of this kind. So this is a temporary increase, which was justified, but which should get phased out. And we should not underestimate the importance of getting back to high GDP growth, which I think we need uh, over the next several years. That's the first point. Then um, on the financial sector, uh, you know, I feel, I mean, it's quite clear that uh, what, uh, what has happened is that the uh, very high NPAs that built up, for some reason, the banks have not been able to reduce these NPAs. Now, remember that the NPAs were at the same level in 2001. And by 2006, we were able to bring it down quite a bit. But that's because growth took place. Here, we haven't had growth. Uh, and I think we, we, we need to get growth back so that the banks can start recovering money. The fact that we have a reconstruction company, a bad bank, which will take over a bad, that by itself is perfectly okay. I mean, the logic of doing that, you know, there are two arguments. One is, look, why doesn't the bank itself write off these loans? You know, when you write off the loans, you clean up your balance sheet, but you don't give up the right to recovery. Write off these loans and then spend as much energy as you can to try and recover. The problem with that is that writing off these loans implies an acceptance that these loans have gone bad. And bankers are very reluctant to do that to loans that they made themselves. So what this asset reconstruction company will do is no, loans that are NPAs, which are non-performing, will be bought by the new company at some agreed price. That agreed price will reflect uh, the banker's own assessment of what the value of the loan really is. But what the bankers will get is not that value. They will get 15% of that value, and the rest will be in some kind of a securitized receipt where if the asset reconstruction company is able to sell these loans at the agreed price, then this money will go back to the banks. If they sell it at less, then proportionately less will go back to the bank. So in a way, it's a way of allowing the banks to pretend that the loan value is much higher than it actually is and delay the point where you have to recognize this because the security receipts won't be all that value. Uh, I mean, in, the alternative would be to accept a lower value and let this, uh, this uh, reconstruction company make the profit. Uh, this way, it's a little roundabout. However, the critical question you rightly say is that what's to stop the same thing happening again? I mean, this will clean out the books, but if the banks are going to keep lending and they keep repeating what they've done in the past, then you're not going to make any difference. And that's really what banking reform is all about. Can we reform the managements of the banks to make them more professional and more accountable? And this is a controversial area which has been much discussed. I talk about it in my book. Uh, I mean, there are some simple things that need to be done. Uh, even before you talk about privatizing the banks, there's no reason why the Reserve Bank of India has less power vis-a-vis -vis the public sector banks than it does vis-a-vis -vis the private sector banks. I mean, in the case of a private sector bank, where the Reserve Bank feels the management is not up to the task, they're able to remove the management. That's not true for a public sector bank. If you were to give that power to the Reserve Bank, the Reserve Bank would then feel that they have to be watchful. Today, unfortunately, the Reserve Bank, which is supposed to be the regulator, also has a representative on the board of the banks. That's wrong in my view. Because the managers can always say that, look, whatever decision we took, we had an RBI representative and a finance ministry representative on the board. That's wrong. 
we shouldn't have any finance ministry representative. We shouldn't have any RBI representative. RBI should look at the public sector banks and exercise the same power that they do in the case of private sector banks. Now, this will require some amendment of the law, but that's not a difficult thing to do. So I think we need real banking reform. And also, I think that more generally, I would say, we should, I agree with the approach that the government is taking, yeah. that they want to privatize some of the public sector banks. Because I, I think we have too large a public sector dominated presence in the banking system. Uh, and, you know, I, I would follow a double approach. I mean, take some public sector banks and actually privatize them. But when you privatize, you can still retain a 26% stake or the management handover to a private sector person. Other banks who try to reform within the public sector, EJ and I have committee have made many recommendations. And let's see what happens at the end of five years. If the privatized public sector banks do better than the ones that still remain under government control, that's telling us something. I personally think that serious banking reform uh, is a very high item or should be a very high item on our agenda. And I don't believe that merging banks within their existing system is any kind of reform. That's just taking a good bank and a bad bank and producing an average bank. I don't think that uh, is very useful. Thank you so much. There are a number of questions. And so what I'll do is I'll first collapse some of them uh, which have come from our international audience. And therefore, a uh, question that is emerging from our colleagues in Nigeria, Malaysia, etc., is that what do you think is your prescription for countries, especially in, um, in uh, Africa, in South Asia? What do they do uh, to get out of this uh, economic depression post-pandemic? What are the three or four things that you do? Sorry, uh, what does these who countries do? do to Poorer countries, Africa, South Asia. I, to be honest, African I don't, countries, I, South I, Asia. You know, in the last 15 years, I've not read a single article on the problems of the poorer countries. So I wouldn't want to presume that I know. But, you know, uh, the, the international development community uh, is looking at their problems. And I think there's general agreement that, you know, they should be assisted financially. But you know, the real problem is that when countries run into difficulties, if the country itself is not willing to undertake reforms or not able to undertake those reforms, no amount of money helps. And money is just a band-aid. I, I just think that they have to, they, I mean, I can't advise because I just don't know enough. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the other question that emerges is, uh, what about the unorganized sector? Uh, is there anything that you would like to prescribe for the large unorganized sector and the workers in the informal economy? Is there something well, that... I think in the course of my lecture, uh, I, I did say that, you know, uh, that's a huge, huge problem. Uh, and uh, we certainly can't neglect uh, the so-called informal sector because it provides a very substantial uh, support for the economy. But, you know, any healthy projection for the Indian economy will also mean a structural change in the informal sector. The informal se some parts of the informal sector survive only because they evade taxation. Okay? As the more organized part of the informal sector begins to uh, feed into the formal economy through the process of formalization, digitalization, uh, banking reform, GST, and other things, they will, they will squeeze out the more informal parts of the informal sector. So quite honestly, uh, I think we, we should expect to see a restructuring taking place spontaneously within the informal sector. And we should do what we can to ensure that those parts of the informal sector that can formalize and improve their productivity have an opportunity to do so. And probably the most important thing from that point of view is really uh, the ability to get credit. Credit expansion uh, 
through the public sector banks is very difficult. But, you know, NBFCs and microfinance institutions do manage uh, to give credit to much smaller economic organizations and even recover money from them. But I think over time, uh, there will be a change in the financial uh, structure where non-bank organizations will be able to expand, to provide credit to the informal sector. This credit will be provided at higher interest rates to cover higher risk, uh, but we should be willing to tolerate that. And of course, most important of all, uh, we need to, we need to um, inject greater growth impulses into the formal sector because it's when the formal sector grows rapidly, especially in those areas that are inherently labor intensive, that there will be a spillover effect on the informal sector also. So if we want a growth process that stimulates more labor intensive forms of growth. In one way, the informal sector's problem is similar to the problem of agriculture. We have 45% of the labor force currently in agriculture. And let's say over the next 20 years, this should go down to 20, which means that almost 25% of the labor force will move out of agriculture into non-agriculture. Most of it will go into the informal sector. But within the informal sector, if it be absorbed, the informal sector must upgrade itself very substantially. We need many more firms, more you know, instead of, we, we talk about micro, small, and medium, actually we need to have many, many more medium. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the tendency, even in the public, is that the most important thing is micro. Micro is very important because every startup is a micro. But what you need is an environment in which people come in quickly uh, into the informal sector as micro enterprises, and if they're not doing well, they move out. But the ones that do well hire the employ uh, hire those who lose jobs, and that's the only way we can get a strong uh, medium, small and medium industry. I think we need much more focus on the modernization of MSME sector. But to be honest with you, and this is a controversial uh, area, many of the micro enterprise representatives are wary of the greater support that the middle, small and middle enterprises, medium enterprises are able to get from the system. You know, uh, banks will end up invariably favoring those enterprises that maintain good records, those enterprises that have good accounts. And to have that, you have to be able to hire accountants, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, if you are going to absorb such a large percentage of the population into the non-agricultural sector, this non-agricultural sector has to become much stronger I mean, the informal sector much stronger, which also means more formal. And more formal means the larger enterprises expand and the smaller enterprises inevitably contract. Not a very, if you were a politician, this is not something you would want to admit in public. But I think that's the truth. Thank you so can, much. There are, can, uh, can, there can, are can, I have, can I have a question? Just I a second, just, just a second. Talk. Yeah, just a second, please. I first have uh, Dr. Mistri, uh, Dr. Mis Malika Mistri. Uh, may I invite you to ask your question, please? We are running out of time. So if we'll have to make this the last question. Yes, last so question. That's, right. That's right. Dr. Malika Mistri and then a short uh, intervention by Professor Dr. Hello, Madhu Rangam. And we... Hello, Alia, sir. Good afternoon. I used to Good see you at conferences. And I'm a fan of uh, Madam Isha uh, Judge. You know, we had oh. very good interaction at BVP, Bharti Vidyapit Pune, and uh, at Neswadia College in Pune. And she yeah. was very fond of Magarpatta City, the, the smart city. She used to talk about it yes, very often. Yes, yes, yes. I remember her. She worked very yeah. hard on those things and they were very close to her heart, actually. What is your uh, connection with Magarpatta? Yeah, I'm in Pune. I'm from Pune City. Okay, so you know about Magasota. Okay. I know, I know, yeah. yeah. In fact, who the architect who framed that, you know, planned yeah. uh, thing, he's a friend of mine, you know, Mr. Uh -huh. Jubeir. Okay. And so, okay. uh, yeah. And then I have three questions. Uh, yes, nice to see you again here. It nice is about you. now 
Recently, the COVID has shown that we have very poor health system, poverty of health structure or health system, mm. you can say. And then uh, our planners have failed over time to develop a good health system. So what do you suggest about this? The second question, you were talking about employment. I would like you to give some, uh, you know, like very concrete measures to provide employment to the teeming young people of India. Otherwise, it will waste, you know, we talk about demographic dividend is becoming a demographic uh, disaster, you know. Then third question, you spoke about education system is becoming poorer. That's very true. In fact, in the, the last two years, it has become very poor. People, still, children have passed without giving exams, et cetera, et cetera. But I hope it's a temporary situation. But uh, what you said is at mass level, uh, we read about primary system, children are unable to read, unable to write, you know, it's very sad. What is going to happen to our people over time, our young people? So I would like you to talk about these things. You can talk in brief because others may be there uh, to ask questions to you. Uh, thank you for giving the opportunity to ask these questions. I'm grateful to all of you. Yeah, please, thank sir. You. Well, uh, that, uh, you raised some very important questions, but they require very extensive answers. Uh, and I don't think I can do justice to them in the time available. But let me just say, uh, certainly weakness in health and education, uh, you're absolutely right. I should emphasize, by the way, that um, the, the main thing, one thing that follows from this is that we need to spend more money. But I think we also know that spending more money doesn't give you the results because all the kids not, I mean, 100% enrollment in schools, but they're not getting educated. I, I mean, the answer to this must be provided by education experts, not me. Uh, the important thing, though, is that this is going to have to happen at the state level. And frankly, I feel that in both uh, education and health, we should have a much more granular analysis of whether different states are getting better results. Are all the states just as bad or are some states are doing better than others? And frankly, I think we should learn from the states that are doing better. I mean, for example, on health, Kerala uh, traditionally has done better. Uh, and we need to learn what is it about the Kerala system that has enabled them to do that. I'm not a sufficient expert. There's a huge amount of work being done on this area. So I would urge you to get someone who knows about education and health to talk to you. And if your organizers are interested, they can get in touch with me. And I will suggest some names. So you will get a good answer. As far as employment is concerned, you're absolutely right. You know, a demographic dividend can become a demographic disaster. But I feel that the most we should, we, should, we should be wary of the kind of people who say that uh, the problem is not raising GDP growth, the problem is providing employment. Any effort to provide employment while ignoring GDP growth will just provide low productivity employment. So frankly, our biggest task right now is to get the GDP growth back up to about 7% from what it is now. You will see that will produce a huge surge of employment and then there'll be many things we have to do over the longer term uh, to make our youth adjusted to the kind of world that we are moving into with rapidly changing technology. And that's not just an India problem, that's a problem all over. Uh, you know, the old model of getting a permanent job supported and defended by the unions, uh, that's dead. But at the same time, we do need, we do need a system uh, where if people are going to keep changing jobs, uh, they have some way of getting social security. And we don't have an adequate system of social security. And uh, the system of social security also has to uh, cater to the person who will be migrating from one state to the other. So th these are things that require a lot of deep thinking. But, you know, the most immediate thing is to bring the growth rate back to where it was. Thank you. I, th I, think, I think we'll have to end at this point. Uh, so I apologize to whoever it was who was not able to get his question in. But thank you all for inviting me. And uh, as I said, if you're interested in uh, someone who could lecture you on education uh, or and health, which are two very, very crucial things, I'd be very happy to recommend some names. Okay. Uh, can I get Dr. Manzoor Alam in, please? Sorry? Uh, Dr. Manzoor Alam, can I invite him, please? Uh, sir, you are muted. Can you unmute yourself, uh, Manzur Alam sir? Am I audible to you? Yes, yes, please. Yes, yes. I can be heard. Yeah. 
I'm very thankful to Dr. Martin to the uh, it is a wonderful speech. He has given he covered so many items. But I am having a few I want few clarification for him, though he has already said that this is the end. Is he is he available to us? Is he listening to us? Yes, is he yes, he is. he is. He is. Yeah, uh, especially in a global changing scenario, increasing gap between have and have not is very obvious, very visible. Technology gap also increasing between them, the have and have not. Structural biasness, emphasizing on that point, structural biasness at social level, at the global level in general, but in India in particular. And the policy is looking in favor of you how to take wealth in a few, the wealth and income to the lowest income bracket group or even the middle income group. What will be the best suggestion from the Monty be How we can overcome about this concentration of wealth in a few hands and the poverty and the poor? And the middle income, in the lower middle income group, how they can serve and how can they play role in the development as a whole. Thank you very much. This is my question as well as appreciation for this wonderful, brilliant talk. So I really, from the Institute of Objective Assessment, really. Well, oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm very bad. Yeah, yeah, sir. Over to Munte Kaluwalia. Um, well, the very big questions, uh, you know, let me say that these problems exist in all countries. Uh, if you go back to our own history, uh, I mentioned in the course of my lecture that between 2004 and 2011, we had a growth rate just under 8% of GDP. It was a period when employment increased. It was a period in which expectations bounded. Yes, many people felt that they were getting less than they had hoped for, but all of them felt things were getting better off. And uh, you had a big decline in poverty. So I think we have demonstrated <clears throat> that if you can get high growth, the notion that the poor do not benefit from growth is not a correct description of the Indian situation. What you have seen in the last few years is there's no there's negative growth and before that slow growth. And I don't see any reason why we should start, uh, fail to focus on the need to restore growth and then see who gets left out and do something for them. I mean, the biggest task before us is to get the growth rate up to where it was during a period when people were in fact doing quite well. So I, I mean, it may not be a very satisfactory answer, but it's a bit late in the day. That, that's basically my answer. I do suggest if you read my book backstage, I address these questions in one or two of those chapters. And uh, I'd be happy to uh, have an email exchange with whoever wants to on those issues. So with those words, let me thank you. I must rush back. So I'm not going to wait for a thank you both because there are people waiting downstairs in a car. Thank you so much. Thank you just say thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks on behalf of everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.